This is not what we had planned. Instead of big crowds, a packed parking lot, and a campus teeming with people, we are now faced with the reality of quiet hallways and empty seats. We've created the physical for the digital. All of our plans have been interrupted. School, online. Restaurants, closed. Sports, cancelled. Now, our feeds are flooded with news updates and press conferences that offer too much information and not enough hope. But sometimes, hope lies ahead. Sometimes Fridays turn into Sundays. On Good Friday, Jesus' followers watched as their leader, their savior, their friend, breathed his last breath on the cross. The promise of overcoming oppression seemed like it had died with him. The one they put all of their hope in was now buried in a tomb. And as Friday turned into Saturday, their future was gone. But as Sunday dawned, hope awakened. As breath filled his lungs, the stone rolled away. As the dejected disciples came to pay their respects to their fallen king, an angel asked, Why are you looking in a tomb for someone who's alive? He isn't here. Jesus is alive, and the same power that conquered the grave lives in us. When things feel out of control and nothing is playing out like you planned, take comfort. The momentary troubles we all face won't last forever. God has a plan for you. Jesus made a way for you. So live like the stone is gone and sing hallelujah. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. He is the light in the darkness. In his freedom we are free. Your best days are still ahead. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So, hold on to faith. The past can remind you, but it does not define you. The present may not be what you expected, but your tomorrow is coming. Welcome to the future. Such 
Christian Life Center. Wow, wasn't that a powerful opener to our Easter weekend services? Wow, that was so, so cool. I'm pumped and excited. Hope that you are too at home. Hey, we got a great service and plan for you. Uh, We're going to celebrate today that Jesus is alive. Amen. If you were in the room together, you would be saying amen. So say amen in the chat room. Jesus is alive. We are so excited. Hey, if you're watching for the very first time, someone invited you, we want to stay connected with you as much as possible. So there is a link in the YouTube live chat that we want you to click. Fill that out. Just a great way to stay connected during this time. Also, we want to keep this service as interactive as possible. We're going to have some fun. Listen, if you are just like feeling something in the worship, if you God is speaking to you in the message, we want to hear from you. Keep it interactive. Throw some praise emojis up in there. Whatever's speaking to you, we want to keep this as interactive as possible during the entire service. Yes, church, please stay interactive with us in the live chat. Another way we want to connect with you is through prayer. We believe that Jesus is alive, that he conquered death, the final enemy, and we believe that he is able to meet your needs right where you're at. So whatever request you have, big or small, know that God can meet that. If you would, please text the word pray to the number here on the screen. We have people here who want to pray with you. We believe that God can is the answer to your prayer request. Hey, church family, we love you and we miss you so much. We want you to take a picture with you and your family. Hashtag CLC Dayton. We want to see what you're doing. We want to see what's going on in your life. Hey, we believe that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, it lives in us. We believe his presence is here in this room, but his presence isn't just limited to this room. The veil was torn. His presence is right where you're at, watching on your computer, your phone, your tablet, your TV. His presence is in the bedroom, it's in the living room, wherever you're at today. Church, let's get ready to worship a God who is not dead, but a God who is alive, who conquered death and the grave. For nothing that you shed in your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone I won't be shackled to the way I was So I'm gonna live like my chains are gone Gone Now my sin is dead and gone And I sing hallelujah Done He is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. My praise is a weapon that will overcome. 
And I'm gonna shout like the battles are won So fall back, tell me your time is up And I'm gonna live like the stone is gone, gone so glad that you have joined us today and we are so excited this Easter weekend that we get to celebrate the King above all kings. So right where you are, let's join together and worship him today. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill
held its breath till that soul was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in
King God. The tomb is empty. He is risen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that on, on that last week of your life, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We're so thankful you were willing to die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, that we could be forgiven. You were buried in the tomb, and we thank God that you rose from the grave on Easter Sunday. You conquered death in the grave. You gave us a hope for this life and beyond. And so we celebrate you. We rejoice today. He is risen. You are risen indeed. And so we pray a blessing on each person with us today. Lord, those who are already following you, that you will reinvigorate and strengthen and inspire our faith. For those watching that are far from you, maybe fallen away, never followed you, that today will be their day, Easter 2020, that they surrender to that miracle-working, way-making God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us. We're glad you are. If you're with somebody, give them an air high five or whatever. Wish them a happy Easter. And we're so thankful that, that you're joining us. It's been an amazing week for us. In a few minutes, we're going to continue our worship with a time of giving. But before we do, if you're a regular CLCer, you know that about 20% of what we receive in our general fund, we don't need for operations. So we put that in our God-sized vision fund. It allows us to do exciting things around the world, literally. From that fund, we build churches in Africa. From that fund, last week we celebrated, we're sponsoring churches that are being new church plants in this country. And from that fund, we're able to say yes this past week uh, to impact our inner city. As I shared last week, and I got a phone call from Convoy of Hope and then later talked to uh, Ambassador Tony Hall, and they said, we'd like to send a truckload of food and supplies to Greater Dayton if you can help us distribute that. We said yes, and I shared that with you, and uh, the truck was valued at $35,000. They had some donors, but we also gave $5,000 toward that. When the truck arrived, we realized that uh, it needed more canned goods, so we went to Meyer and Englewood and spent another $5,000. So that $10,000 came from the God Size Vision Fund. Thank you for what you give. If you shop at Meyer and Englewood, thank the manager because they donated $2,000 to that as well in goods. And then last week I mentioned it, and 250 of you volunteered like that to be here. And Thursday and Friday, we unloaded the convoy truck, packaged it all up, and we helped refortify the food pantries of 11 inner city churches that we partner with across Greater Dayton. Thank you so much. We also helped Victory Project with their outreach. And then on Friday, over 100 families from just the nearby suburbs came by who are negatively impacted financially by the pandemic. We were able to give them groceries as well. First, the florist donated 150 Easter plants. We were able to give that to them as well just to encourage them. And so I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. You showed that while this is a church building, we as the people of CLC are the church. And there are a couple of thank yous that are geared directly to you. Hello, everyone, and God bless you. My name is Pastor Isaac from Fuentes de Agua Viva, FDAV Church here in Dayton, Ohio. And we just want to send a big God bless you to everyone uh, who has helped out. Just want to say thank you to Christian Life Center for blessing our neighborhood. You guys are awesome. We're so incredibly thankful to be in a relationship with you. Have an awesome week. Thank you once again to everyone who gave. And know that this is going to, uh, to feed many people in our community. And uh, we're just excited to see the good praise report that's going to come from this. God bless you. I love you from Puentes de Agua Viva. This is the Starry family. We are the Meskers. We are the Bridge family. We are the Trigoning family. We are the Burton family. We are the Browns. My name's Chelsea Tiley. We are the Seal Balls. The Stanton family. The Inmans. We are the Inmans. Hello, we're the Seaman family. And we are the Huddles. We are the Thomases. We're the Correll family. The Penny family. We are the Van Fleet family. One of the things we love about CLC is the people. I love our worship team, but I also love Pastor Stan. We love the worship and how CLC loves on students and our kids. They value everyone, and it feels like family. The people and the fellowship. The amazing Kids Life program. We love CLC because of the friendships and the support we found there. Because it offers something for everyone. From the youngest. To the oldest. And everyone in between. We love the support of our growing family. We love Kids Life. I love a God-sized vision and how we help the community in time of need. We love CLC because of the amazing community of family that we have. We have great pastors. Serving the community, 
worshiping together, hanging out in student life, and listening to biblical teaching. The lifelong friendships that it has given me and the supporting community that I now have. We love the teaching at CLC. The amazing student life program for middle schoolers and high schoolers. We love how our church provides a wide variety of opportunities to serve others. The community that we found there and the amazing Kids Life Ministry. We change our community. And we change our world. We, we are, are the McCanns. And, and we are the church. And we are the church. And we are the church. My name is Lindsay Sizemore, and we are the church. And we are the church. We are the Lachances, and we are the church. We are the church. We are Sophia and Lexi, and we are the church. And we are the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. We, we are, are the church. church. We, we are, are the church. church. We are the church. And we are the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. And we are the church. Well, happy Easter, church family. My name's Anna Collins, and I work on the weekend services team here. And, you know, this isn't what we planned. We would have much rather had you here with us in services this weekend. But since that's not possible, we are so grateful for the many ways that we can continue to connect as a church family online. We love seeing your name and your comments pop up as you engage with our services. Keep doing that. It lets us know that you're here, that you are engaged. You can also follow us on Facebook at Christian Life Center or on Instagram at CLC Dayton. And one more way that you can continue to engage with us is through your giving. You know, you can give in a multitude of different ways. You can give online securely at clcdayton.com. You can also give through the CLC app. Or if you prefer a more traditional method, you can mail in your gifts to 3489 Little York Road. Let's pray over the offering. Jesus, we thank you for Easter and the good news that it is for us. And Jesus, we recognize that you are our greatest example of both obedience and sacrifice. And Lord, we want to look like you and we want to put you first in every area of our lives, God. And that includes our finances. Jesus, I pray that you would bless these tithes and these offerings as they come in, that you would use them to bless our city and our world in your name. And Lord, we're so grateful for the privilege to be a part of the ministry that you're doing in spreading this good news. In your name, amen. Hey, wake up. It's Easter Sunday. Get up. Get up. We got to get ready for church. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Let's go. No. Mm -mm. Honey, what are you wearing? Should I wear the purple or the pink? What do you think? Good morning. How are you? Welcome to CLC. It's good to have you here today. Six feet, Scott. Social distancing. Hello, welcome to Kids Life. Do you have any children to check in today? Scott, Allie is 25. Mm. Hello, ma'am. Welcome to CLC Cafe. Would you like a Pop-Tart? <clears throat> Hold on, ma'am. Lots of traffic today. Hold on. We've got customers coming through. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Good to have you here today. Okay, ma'am. Please proceed. Good to have you here today. Would you like a seat? That's all we've got. We didn't go to the store. Likewise, use us to be a blessing to our city. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Well, thank you. So Ma'am, sorry. Stay back on the stage, please. Stay back on the stage. Thank you. Thank I you. just want water. Come back again next week, ma'am. God, God bless you. We live together. I've seen that a half a dozen times. I laugh every time. 
Good job, Scott and Karen. Way to go. That was wonderful. Even the cats come to church. <laughs> so anyways, well, happy Easter. Uh, that's a reminder to you, during this pandemic season when so much is unknown, Watch enough news, not too much. Uh, stay strong in your faith, but also keep a sense of humor. And my friends are practicing what I preach. And even at this Easter season with the pandemic, I can't get away from certain brands of humor, like this text I got yesterday. They said, I'm thinking of you. And here we go. The Cleveland Browns social distancing themselves from the playoffs since 2002. And I'm ready to say this is not going to be our year, okay? It's just the way it is. And uh, this might be humorous to some of you, maybe some of the wives especially, painful for us husbands. But uh, Friday night after a good Friday service, we've been broadcasting live to kind of keep it as normal as possible for you at home. And so I got home and uh, Joyce, we were talking, she greeted me and then she handed me a little gift bag and said, Happy Easter, this is for you. I got you a card and I got you something. And I was kind of caught flat footed. I'm like, how did you have time to do this? I mean, for the last month, she's had two surgeries, a biopsy, came and dry most of the time. And she says, well, I planned ahead. Ooh, that was a little jab there, guys, you know. And so she gave me a shirt and said, this will look great, one of your sport coats. So a la Joyce's wardrobe selection. And, uh, and then I told her, well, I have some confession, a confession to make. I said, I actually, about six weeks ago, I was proud of myself. I thought way ahead. I bought you a card for Easter. And then I paused, and she said, and you don't know where it is. And I can't find that card to save my life. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine last night emailed me, I still can't find my wife's birthday card from two months ago. So guys, help me out here in solidarity. If you have that dilemma happen, would you let me know on the chat room or even some wives so I'm not alone in that, all right? And uh, just as a P.S. humor to that, today when I was leaving to come to service, while she's in this service, first service, I'm away at the door, she goes, thanks for the Easter card. <laughs> so, and I thought when I woke up this morning, I thought I remember where it was. It wasn't there. So anyways, what we want to talk about uh, the message today, the whole theme of the service, is this is not what we had planned. Truer words were never spoken. As you would imagine, we look ahead, and once, once Christmas is done, in January we start talking about Easter, and the team gets diligent putting plans together. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Ryan came to me and said, we've got to change everything up. We can't do what we thought we were going to do. And so literally this service from start to finish is not what we had planned. And if you go back to the first Easter, uh, that actually would have been a good theme. This is not what we had planned. And so I want to, this is interactive, remember, okay? I know you're sitting there at home in your comfort of whatever, or maybe even looking on your phone. Uh, this is interactive. If we can come up here and give it out to mostly empty seats, uh, then we want you to be responsive. So I want to go back to the first Easter. I'm going to say the phrase, and then I want you to say, welcome to Easter, okay? So this is not what we had planned. Welcome to Easter. Try it again. This is not what we had planned. Very good, because that's really what would have echoed through the minds of the disciples. Let's go back there and realize a risk that comes to us when we're in the midst of a season that is not what we had planned. Obviously, we're caught by surprise. If it's a pleasant surprise, we're good with that. But when it's difficult, when it's enduring, like what we're going through, uh, we can be disappointed. It can lead to anxiety as it lingers, it's stress, uh, even fear. And for some, battling depression now as the unknowns just seem to loom larger. There's an overly inward focus as it lingers, and surely we're told to, to go ahead and kind of hunker down in our homes and social distancing and all that. We kind of get over, overly focused on us. But the greatest danger in a season that's not what we had planned is we can miss seeing what God had planned. Question, it's a pandemic, it's worldwide. What do you suppose God has planned during this time? What does he have planned worldwide? What does he have planned to accomplish and to do in you? That's the question we want to address today. And we're going to start by going back to the disciples and see how they show us in a very realistic way that when you're in the midst of a season that's unplanned, you can totally miss what God's about to do. Let me take you to one of the, the Easter presentations in the gospel. The women who followed Christ were there at his death at the cross. They followed to, to the tomb he was buried in, but because it was about to be the Sabbath, they couldn't finished their embalming. So they went and bought spices and rested on Saturday. And the Easter Sunday morning, the account picks up in Luke chapter 24. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. 
And they remembered his words. And they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna the Mary, and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. Now let me stop there. These women went to the tomb in grief, expecting to somehow get to the body of Jesus and, and finish the embalming process. They did not expect to see the t- stone rolled away. They did not expect to encounter angels and to find the body gone. They run with a mixture of of adrenaline and excitement and anticipation and and confusion and fear. And they go to the disciples. And they go to these 11 men. Judas is now gone. They go to the disciples. These are the men who watched Jesus turn water into wine. These are the men who days before pledged their loyalty to him, their undying loyalty. These are the men who saw Jesus walk on the Sea of Galilee. They saw him stand up in a boat and say, peace be still to the storm, and it was. They saw him heal the blind and the lame. And these men, when the the women came to them, here's how they responded. Verse 11, but these words appeared to them, the disciples, as nonsense, and they would not believe them. That sounds almost too difficult to believe. You look at Matthew, he says the same thing. When they saw him, Jesus, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful, talking about the disciples. In Mark, they went away, the women reported to the others, to the disciples, and they did not believe them. In John, chapter 20, the end of the gospel, as they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Over and over and over again, the Bible tells us that the disciples almost missed what God was doing because this is not what they had planned. Certainly in their imagination, they did not imagine that Jesus, their their Lord and Savior, the one that they were sure was the Messiah, would be charged and tried and executed and crucified. That wasn't what they planned. They didn't plan to, to see them take his body off and put it in a borrowed tomb. They didn't plan for him to be buried and to be dead. And they didn't plan, as miraculous as he was, to have him rise from the dead. And they almost missed it. Thankfully, God opened their eyes and opened their hearts and they saw it. And what we see is that eventually God's people realize that this, seasons of uncertainty, is the essence of walking by faith and not by sight. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of what we don't see yet. And when we are living in the midst of what we did not plan, we walk by faith and not by our plans, not by our feelings, not by our understanding And for us cognitive types like to figure everything out and solve problems, it is really hard as situations linger, as the pandemic keeps going and going and going, and I can't figure it out. I don't know how to fix it. Don't know what the answer is. And yet we're forced to walk by faith. And as we look back over the history of biblical history and the people that have been people of faith, we realize that 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 becomes a point not of fear but of anticipation. In Jeremiah 29, 11, we love to quote the verse, and it's a favorite verse where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for a future and a hope for welfare, not for calamity. But couple that verse with what Isaiah teaches us in chapter 55, that God says, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So God's ways and God's thoughts higher than ours, that doesn't surprise us too much, He's infinite. He's omnipotent, omniscient. We're not. So realize that God's plans are going to be higher than ours. They're going to be beyond what we can fully understand. In fact, we'll never fully comprehend what God has planned for us. And yet, the phrase, this is not what we had planned, is what followers of God thrive on in their faith. So I want you to say, rather than welcome to Easter, I want you to say welcome to life. We're going to try that again, all right? I'm going to say, this is not what we had planned. You're going to say, welcome to life. This is not what we had planned. Welcome to life. The pandemic is not what we planned. Say it again. Welcome to life. If you think I'm overstating it, let me take you back through Scripture, especially if you go to Hebrews 11. These people are mentioned there as heroes of faith, and they live through the kind of uncertainty I'm talking about. Let's look at Noah. Noah had plans to live a righteous, quiet life with his wife and his three sons. And then all of a sudden, Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 happened to Noah. It's a good thing. It sounds amazing when you hear it. Genesis 6, 8 simply says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Say found favor. Basically, the Bible says Noah was living a righteous life. He was trying to honor God in what he did, what he said, how he lived. 
and he found favor with God. And when a person finds favor with God, he blesses them, right? He blesses them with maybe a big screen TV or a raise or a new home or a new job. No, 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 no. That's how we Americanize the favor of God. And while I like big screens and homes and things and all that, when we find favor with God, what it means is God has tested our character. He sees our heart. And he knows that we can be trusted with an opportunity to join him in his purpose and to help fulfill his plan with his, his strength. And so, Noah, did you ever have a situation maybe in your career where your career, where you're at right now, is not what you had planned? You'd have something to talk about with Noah. Because Noah finds himself having found favor with God, and you know the plan. God had him build an ark, and it's safe to say that Noah, up until this point in his life, had never even seen a ship. He's in the Middle East. He's not near an ocean or a large body of water. And yet here he is now. He wasn't a shipbuilder. And I'm sure throughout that process that took decades to do, on the, on the framing of that ship, on the decks of that ship, finishing it up, he certainly would have smiled and said, this is not what I had planned. Let's look at Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, when we meet them, he's 75, she's 65. They've battled infertility and, and given up the fight. And God comes to them in Genesis chapter 12 and makes them a promise with three dimensions to it. He says, I'm going to lead you to a land that I'll give you. Verse 2, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And there we see the concept, we're blessed to be a blessing. Would you say, I'm blessed to be a blessing? Always in life. And then he says, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And I'm so thankful that we see Israel as our ally in the Middle East, and our, our president and our government honors them and blesses them. It's a blessing to us. He says, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Man, can you imagine when God spoke to, to Abraham about that? Man, honey, we are blessed. God's made a promise. We're going to be a great nation. And they're, they're celebrating. So we're going to have a baby and grandbabies and great, great grandbabies. And they can't wait. And then they wait. A year, nothing. Two years, five years, no kids, no grandkids. 10 years, nothing. 15 years, 17, 20, 22 years. They're waiting and waiting and waiting. And they would certainly have said at almost 25 years, this is not what we had planned. Have you ever had a promise from God or sensed you did? A call, an opportunity, and you sensed God was in it, and yet it never seemed to come around. You ever had plans for your family to have children or to have, I mean, we tend to write the storybook of our life. Did you ever have that imagined in your mind and what you planned only to find out that where you're living and what you're at is totally different? Abraham and Sarah could identify with that. And when he finally hit 100 years old and she was 90, they gave birth to their firstborn son. They named him Isaac, which means laughter, because they had to laugh with each other and say, wow, God made a promise. His ways are higher than ours, and this is not what we had planned. You might be in that same situation in your own life, your own family, your own hopes and dreams. Trust him. And then you look at Joseph. Joseph was his father's favorite Did you ever have an anticipation of what your family was going to be like, maybe with siblings? the dreams that God gave you, and you find yourself years later saying in the midst of it, boy, this is not what I planned. That would have been Joseph's life. Joseph had a God-given dream of greatness that's recorded in Scripture when he was 17 years old. And he goes and he tells his brothers about that dream. It might have been a misstep, but basically in the dream, his brothers bowed down and paid respect to him. And that just fueled their fires of resentment because they knew that Joseph was dad's favorite and so one day he's out in the fields and his brothers kind of jump him and throw him into a pit, take his coat from him, and they sell him to Midianite traders that were passing by into slavery. And as a slave, Joseph had to say to himself, wait a minute, I had a dream of greatness. I know God put that in my heart. This is not what I'd planned. And then during being a slave, he's falsely accused of a crime he did not commit and finds himself in prison. Mind you, ancient prisons would have been places that were very unsanitary, very undesirable, a miserable place to be. He would have thought, this is not what I had planned. And then in prison, when his hopes got up, he might be released on parole. He, he, he gets forgotten and delayed two more years. And he had to wonder, what's going on? And then when Joseph, that happened, he was 17. He wastes away in slavery and imprisonment in the years from 17 to 30 years of age. And then when he's 30 years of age, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has a dream. 
No one can interpret it, but God gives Joseph a divine interpretation of that dream. The dream was that there'd be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And God gave Joseph not just the interpretation, but the wisdom to concoct the plan to help Egypt prosper and succeed and thrive in that and become the breadbasket of the world. And so listen to what it says in uh, Genesis chapter 41. In verse 46, it says, Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. You, my friend, at 30 years of age, having come from your father's household, sold to slavery, wrongly imprisoned, forgotten, are now standing before me, and you will be number two in the entire Egyptian empire. Ruled the world at the time. You know Joseph had to turn with a smile and bewilderment on his face and say, this is not what I had planned. So Joseph, he's 30. There's seven years of plenty, and he, he stores things up, and Egypt becomes the breadbasket of the world. And then sometime after 37, the famine begins to spread. And his brothers in Israel, their father says to them, go to Egypt, try to buy grain. Long story short, they end up coming to Egypt. They come before Joseph. They don't recognize him. Last time they saw him, he was 17. He's now a mature man, full garb, beard, all the, all the Egyptian uh, paraphernalia to go with it. And the Bible says they came in and they, they bowed down in Joseph's presence to ask for mercy and can we please buy grain. You've got to know Joseph had an aha moment. This is what God had planned. This moment here is what I dreamt of when I was 17. It took not just 13, it took probably 20 years plus for this to come to fulfillment. Look what God had planned. And then you fast forward. We see how God works in us during those seasons, those years, those decades of uncertainty. Because later in the story, the Bible says that when his brothers realized who he was, they were horrified, waiting for him to call for a death sentence of revenge. But Joseph had long since let go of any, any bitterness, any unforgiveness. And he said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. This isn't what I had planned. I know it's not what you had planned. But God had plans to go beyond our ability to comprehend, to figure out, or make sense of. And if you find yourself in that kind of a situation with your family, with your dreams, trust that God has plans. And then Moses when Moses was born, it's, it's four centuries now after Joseph, and the Israelites have been enslaved in Egypt for all that time. And when he's born, there exists a national death decree that Pharaoh's trying to curb the population of Jewish slaves. So if a boy is born, they're to do basically full-term abortion. When the baby's born, kill it. The midwives of Israel refused to do that. And so then... Pharaoh says, okay, then when a baby boy is born, he's to be thrown into the Nile River and drowned. Well, Moses' mother said to herself, this is not what I had planned. When I got married, when I conceived and had a baby boy, my plan was not to see him drown in the Nile. I'll not do that. So the Bible says uh, in Exodus chapter 2, the woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. She could hide him no longer. That baby was getting, getting louder, going to be his own little person. She got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And you can imagine when she concocted this plan and put him in the, in the cattails of the Nile, her heart was beating out of her chest as she watched with fear, hoping that somehow this plan would work. And I'm sure she thought to herself, when I dreamed as a child of someday getting married and having children, this is not what I planned. She put her, her daughter there to, to watch and to kind of keep track of what was going on so that her daughter could report to her. And ironically, providentially, Pharaoh's daughter comes and finds that baby and adopts Moses into Pharaoh's household. This very baby that Pharaoh wanted to die in the Nile gets adopted into his home. And Moses is raised for, for 40 years as part of Pharaoh's household. When he's around 40 years old, he's out just inspecting things. He sees a, an Egyptian abusing a, a Hebrew slave. He defends the slave and in so doing, kills the Egyptian, buries him in the sand, but word spreads and there's now a death warrant out for his arrest. Moses flees. I'm sure Moses then for 40 years is a, is a shepherd in the wilderness with who would be his father-in-law Jethro watching his sheep. How many days was he looking back over life? How often have you ever looked back over life and said, man, this is not what I had planned? Where I am now, a shepherd. 
Likewise, one day while he's tending those sheep, he sees there's a bush burning in the desert. I'm told that's not unusual in a hot, dry land. But what was unusual, the bush wouldn't burn up. It just kept burning and burning and burning. And then the voice spoke to him from the bush. It's the voice of God saying to Moses, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. As Moses bowed in reverence, God spoke to him and said, I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. We know that wasn't what Moses had planned because he argues with God. He debates with God over what he feels God's telling him to do. Do you ever try to argue with God? You probably have. I know I have. I never win those arguments. I'm glad. And so Moses ends up heading back to Egypt and he stands before Moses, for before Pharaoh, never thinking he would, saying, let my people go. And over the next many weeks and months of horrendous plagues and outpourings, Pharaoh decides to go ahead and let them go. Read the story. He leads this parade of Israelites between one and a half and two million people, scholars estimate, out of Egypt, through the wilderness, and they camp at the Red Sea. What a beautiful campsite. That might, better than any KOA you've ever stayed at if you're a camper, right? And they stay there at the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, there's a disturbance of all the Israelites. Something's wrong. They hear a rumble behind them. And as Pharaoh has changed his mind, and the armies of Egypt are crashing full toward them to reclaim them and to take them as prisoners. The people are crying for fear in the camp. There's anxiety everywhere. This is not what we had planned. We didn't plan to be in the first place, but now we thought we were delivered, and all of a sudden the story doesn't have a happy ending? You ever been there? Have you ever longed for something? You finally get relief, and then it feels like that itself is falling apart. We learn a lesson here when things don't go according to plan. Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? What are you depending on your, stop going by your plan, Moses. I'm not a God who's just standing here wondering what to do. He says, tell the people to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff, you know, that shepherd's staff, stretch it out over the sea and divide it, and the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. And Moses had to think to himself, I have seen it all, and now God has a plan? I'm supposed to lift up my staff, and he did. And as he did, the winds began to blow, and the sea began to part. And I'm sure as the sea parted and the people went across on dry land, Moses had to say to himself, this is not what I had planned. Thank God it's not what I had planned. And to those of you that are camped next to a sea of resistance, and there's opposition closing in on you in life and you don't know what to do and you want to cry out in fear, let me remind you that we do not serve a shoulder-shrugging God. Well, there's a pandemic. Good luck with that. Don't know what to tell you. You got a crisis, whether it's in your family, your health, your finances, your career, whatever the case might be, God's not shrugging his shoulders saying, sorry, didn't expect this. No, on the contrary, God says, I'm glad you asked me. God is looking for people who will model what Jesus said in the Garden of the Gethsemane. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And a pandemic season can be, as I talked last week, a garden of surrender for us. I don't know about you. In a weird way, part of me is glad the pandemic didn't just last for a couple days and feel kind of like a glorified snow day. Because we'd have been back to normal right away. But as it lingers, our faith is tested. As it lingers, our feelings are overwhelmed. As it lingered, we wonder what the answer is and what, where to go next, where to turn. And we of faith are finding that, you know what? When we go through those seasons that are not as we had planned, that's when God does some of his greatest work. And finally, let's look at a young woman named Mary. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. But she was perplexed at this. Oh, I'm sorry. Coming in, the angel said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was perplexed. Would you say, uh-oh? Yeah, because this angel comes in, hail, favored one, you found favor with God. Reminds you of Noah, who found favor with God? And when a person finds favor with God, one thing we know is that things are about to go different than what they'd planned. Same is true for Mary. She and Joseph were engaged like any engaged couple. Her mind was filled with all the dreams of her wedding and her husband and all the plans. I'm sure they'd said yes to the dress and they picked, picked the venue. They were planning the feast they were going to have and the new life that they would build together. But this favored one, we find that all of a sudden things are, are turned upside down. 
When God says, hail, favored one, it means that there's an opportunity for you. I have to think that God said to CLC, you found favor. Last Memorial Day, when the tornadoes hit, 1,700 of you volunteered to serve. We came alongside Convoy of Hope and ministered to our community. And so that finds favor with God when we're part of his plan. And so, no surprise, Easter week, we get a call from Convoy of Hope, CLC, will you minister to the community and serve them, favored ones? Because the last thing we planned two days before Easter, Thursday and Friday, was to do a major community outreach with Convoy of Hope. But when God says, hail favored one, it means I've got a plan. I want you to be part of it. So we celebrate that. Mary said yes. And the plans she had were pushed by the wayside. And I can only imagine as you fast forward to when that baby, that miraculous baby was born. And she's sitting there in that, in that barn holding newborn Jesus. Picture when the, when, the, when the shepherds came and they tell her this incredible story. The angels appeared in the sky to, to come and worship this newborn Savior. She had to say to herself, this is not what I had planned. And then wise men from some Middle Eastern country show up and they, they lay before her and Joseph a, a fortune of gold and, and, and ancient spices. And again, they tell her how this is the one that they've read about in prophecy. And she had to say, this is not what I had planned. When I dreamed of Joseph and our life together and children, I did not plan on this. But we see in Mary the beauty of a life that's surrendered to one who says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for a future and a hope. And as Mary yielded to those plans, it didn't make sense to her. She not only had a future and a hope, but she also gave a future and a hope to all of us. Now, the plans of God and the path he leads us on are not, not always pleasant. Sometimes there's heartache and trouble and distress. Because you fast forward 33 years later, and Mary finds herself at the end of the Gospels. And the Bible says in John 19, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Here we see Mary in the heart of God's plan with a broken heart. Nobody plans for a broken heart. And yet sometimes the path of life and the plans that God has, it doesn't spare us of that. And yet we find that Mary still was one who trusted. She knew that God had a plan. He'd spoken to her. She was a favored one. She trusted God all the way through. Thankfully, she trusted God past the crucifixion to an empty tomb and a resurrection. And a resurrection. The question for us on Easter weekend is how about you? Are you trusting the God who says, I know the plans I have for you because he does? The difference is you have to say yes to that plan. Are you living in the midst of a season as all of us are that is not what you had planned and the anxiety is overcoming? If you're here with a broken heart, God can help mend it. If you're watching this and you have a guilty heart, God can forgive it. If you have a lonely heart, he said he'd never leave us or forsake us. If your heart's overwhelmed with anxiety, he will give you peace. But you've got to surrender your heart, surrender your life to him and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And when you do, you can celebrate the historical truth that the tomb was empty and Jesus is risen and alive today. And so we try to gear our Easter services in two directions, to inspire those of us that are believers, but also to offer those who aren't an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. We want to do that now in prayer before I finish the message. I'm going to ask you just to bow your hearts with me. And if you're here today watching this and you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, but there's a stirring in you. Maybe the pandemic is going on long enough and you realize, wow, I'm empty inside. I need some kind of foundation, some source, somewhere to turn. That's God speaking to you today. I invite you to surrender your life to Jesus with a spiritual conversation that we call a prayer. Would you quietly repeat this prayer with me of surrender? Dear Jesus, I come to you today. I realize I need you. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I surrender my life to you today. Please be my Lord and Savior. In the midst of all this uncertainty, from this day forward, help me to grow to know you, to love you, and to serve you, and to follow you the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing and receiving me today. It's in your name I pray. And Lord, I pray for those all across the Miami Valley and from the, from the uh, computer addresses all around the world that heard that, that prayed that prayer today from their heart in this uncertain pandemic season, Lord, that they will know your peace, that they'll have an assurance of your plan for their life, and that they'll know your goodness and your grace. 
Help us to be a church that can encourage them to become all they can be in following after Christ. Thank you for that gift of salvation and eternal life and hope in you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the question is, okay, now what? Now what do I do to, be, to follow Christ? At the close of the service, I'll tell you how you can get more information on that. But let's go ahead and bring this around. After Mary, I could go on and on all day. I could talk about, about Paul. At the end of his life, he helped found the New Testament church. And he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. I know there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. But if you, when you look at Paul's writings, he looks back over his life. And as an apostle chosen by God, he was beaten and whipped and imprisoned and left for dead and shipwrecked. Over and over, he would have said, this is not what I had planned. But he was faithful. Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, became a leader of the New Testament church, and he died a martyr's death. And in that, he could easily have thought, this is not what I planned. God's plans for us don't always end in a rosy picture on this life, but it's got eternity in view. Even Jesus' best friend, John, talk about isolation. He was sent to the island of Patmos as an exile, like the island of extinction, only one person. No contact, totally isolated. And I'm sure in the final days of his life, he thought to himself, Boy, after walking with Jesus and being his best friend and, and being with him at the Last Supper and after his resurrection, this is not what I had planned, but God's ways are higher than my ways. And so how do we fast forward that to us? How does that apply to us as believers today? Well, most of that came from Hebrews 11, looking back over heroes of faith, and the author then goes to Hebrews 12, and that brings it up, up to today. Therefore, say therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, all these saints who have gone before us, all these people who lived through not what I had planned. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance, every pandemic distraction, and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance, say endurance, the race that's set before us. Friends, sometimes following Christ and his plan is an uphill climb. Run the race with endurance. Fixing our eyes on Jesus when people distract when circumstances pull us away, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, the joy of hearing well done, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God at a place of victory. That's how we take courage. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We realize this is a race of endurance. The plan God has is not an easy one. And we find ourselves where we did not have things planned, but we trust him. So what do we know? And as things are uncertain, we don't know when we're going to get back to normal. We don't know the financial implications. There's so much we don't know about our jobs, our lives, our lifestyles, our church. Here's what we do know. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know, say we know. We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I want to unpack that verse. I don't believe that verse is saying God causes all things. And uh, in the book, God, Where Are, Where Are You?, uh, I unpacked that in a sermon series, one of my favorite series we did uh, a couple of years ago, about how, where does God fit in this? I believe God causes all things to work together for good. Joyce and I had a long conversation about that this past week. And in working things together for good, I look back over the trials and hardships and pain and disappointments in life. And I can't say that working together for good, we say, you know, it doesn't mean that it makes it all worthwhile or we don't mind that it happened. There are tragedies and difficulties in the past that I still wish didn't happen. But when I look back over it, I can see how God somehow will speak, somehow will shape or guide or strengthen. And it's not that it makes those things worth it, but for our darkest moments and our greatest pain and disappointments, the resurrection power of God will somehow raise beauty from the ashes. He works that together for good. And we'll see part of our character that was shaped in darkness. We'll see part of our peace that passes understanding was, was, was grown in a time of great uncertainty, anxiety, and fear. So Paul says this, what then shall we say to these things? And he suggests the answer, if God is for us, who is against us? But that question is not just rhetorical. It's for each of us. What then shall we say to these things? What do we say to times of uncertainty? What do we say when our life, our marriage, our career, society is not what we had planned? You have a choice. Will you say things of hope or things of despair? Paul suggests to us, say, if God is for me, who is against me? 
Then he goes on to say, who will separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will tribulation or distress? No. Will persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness, peril, sword, pandemic? No, no, no. But I am convinced in all these things, we're overwhelmingly, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the confidence we have. And those words are true because the grave is empty. Jesus is risen. And we have faith in Him. And so before we close the service, we have a song we want to share with you to inspire you, to remind you that we serve one who turns mourning into dancing. We serve the one who raises beauty from our ashes. Go back and look. He's the one who gives us glory from our shame. Talk to Ezekiel. He'll tell you that he raises up armies from dry bones. Moses will tell you he turns seas into highways. And those ladies at first Easter will tell you that he turns graves into gardens. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty place, and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you well I know I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Out of place, your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, I know. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than. truth that our God is for us. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who gave. You turn morning to dancing. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. 
that you turn graves into gardens. You turn seas into highways. And we declare our gratitude and our faith in you. And we are so thankful because the tomb was empty. We know you're the only one who can. Lord, I pray for those right now who, who have a sea of opposition and an army of fear in their life. Lord, I pray you'll turn that sea into a highway. I pray that you'll provide, that you'll guide. For each of us, God, as we go through this time of uncertainty, help us with those who've gone before us to say, when life is not what we had planned, I walk by faith and not by sight. And in Christ, we will thrive through this. Be glorified. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I'm so glad you're with us. And I said earlier, if you prayed to accept Christ, we want to help you with that. What next? Text the word YES, the number on your screen, and our team will get in touch with you and share with you resources that will answer the questions for you. We're happy to send that to you and how we as a church can help you in any way we can. And uh, then next week, we're going to start a new sermon series. The guys will tell you about that. Wednesday night, uh, we'll continue, and I'm going to share things the pandemic is teaching us. So if you're online today in the chat room, before you log off, what is the pandemic season teaching you? What questions are you asking? How are you growing and learning? Feel free to share that with us. We'll talk about Wednesday night. Thanks so much. Happy Easter. Wow, what a powerful, inspired message from Pastor Stan. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I sure did. It spoke to me. We are so glad that you decided to join us for our Easter online experience to celebrate that Jesus is alive. Hey, we're still here for you. This could be a difficult season for some of us. And so if you need prayer, you can text PRAY to 937-818-4024. Text us. We'd love to pray with you during this time. Church, thanks for connecting with us. We would love for you to connect with us again next Sunday. Pastor Stan is preaching a message, Christians Are. For our high school and middle school students, we're going to be going live tonight at 7 o'clock. We'd love to see you there. We love you. We miss you, church. Thank you.